what is a successful uh, MDR engagement? And you also mentioned the potential of having an unsuccessful engagement uh, using MDR. Uh, what does that look like as well? Yeah, um, <laughs> that is a $64,000 question if ever there was one. <laughs> you cannot determine risk unless you know what it is you want to protect in the first place. If you focus on the fundamentals, everything gets a little bit easier. Scrapes and scratches and even to an extent broken bones are okay, but I really want to protect their brain. Who says tech can't be human? What is going on, Hacker Valley fam? Welcome back to the show. I am so excited because we have Hacker Valley Studio. Hacker Valley Studio is a podcast, but we come to you live and start the podcast there so you could be a part of the discussion. And yes, this event is live. Right now, we just got done hosting the Sands Difference Makers Awards. So I'm still here in uh, Washington, D.C. We would love to engage and just have a great conversation. And to kick this topic off, right, we need to think about a world where we can have our cybersecurity program not just be uh, reactive, not where we're just trying to bounce back, but we're, where we're trying to leap forward. To talk about this topic, I brought in a great guest and also the sponsor for this episode, DeepWatch. Our guest today is Bill Bernard, Vice President of Security Strategy at DeepWatch. Bill, welcome to the live stream. Thanks, glad to be here today. Glad to be here on the, uh, the Hacker Valley Network. Yes, glad to have you. Big shout outs to DeepWatch. Big thank you to the team over there. Uh, I've worked with DeepWatch for at, with, at a few organizations I've worked at. And I got to say, if you haven't checked out DeepWatch yet, you got to check them out. Uh, but most importantly, Bill, I would, I, I would love to hear a little bit about what your role is at DeepWatch. You're the VP of Security Strategy. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and what does it mean to be a security strategist at DeepWatch? Sure. So my background, I've been in information security for 20 and some odd years. Um, you can tell by some of the gray hair. Uh, it's, been, <laughs> it's been, you know, quite, quite a ride, right? Uh, so I started off in security as the practitioner. I was the firewall admin, the spam filter admin, once again, showing my age. Things along those lines uh, moved into um, an architect's role inside security organization, helping to make sure that we had strong security policy process and then had the right tools in place, uh, left that side of the house, decided, you know, it was, it was time for a change. I moved over into security sales engineering roles. So helping uh, work with customers with the, figure out the, the wide array of tools, technologies and capabilities that are out there today. Uh, spent many years doing that, uh, moved into focusing more on helping customers with service uh, requirements, with uh, risk assessments and penetration tests. And so I got to see a little bit about a lot of things, a great view of all of the different things available out, out there in information security land today and moved into DeepWatch uh, a little over five years ago now. I work uh, in some ways as a liaison between what's going on in the real world and what our development teams and our, our um, product teams are, are building and trying to do and really help uh, bridge some of the gaps between uh, you know, the great work that gets done inside of, uh, inside of a think tank, if you will, inside the organization, inside of the product, product group, inside of the delivery group, and helping make sure that the industry understands what we're able to do to help them out and what prospects and customers are able to understand that as well. Love that. Appreciate that. Thank you for that rundown. Uh, when I first learned about DeepWatch, it was through just interacting with Charlie, and he said, hey, Bill is the glue as a security strategist. I, I think that, you know, that's a great representation. Like you're probably touching many areas. And, you know, what I know about DeepWatch is that you all help uh, kind of combat against emerging threats. So, you know, maybe you could give us a little bit of the landscape of emerging threats. I think what emerging threats meant when I first got started in cybersecurity and what it means today is a little different. So where are we at with emerging threats? Uh, I, the, there's there's so many of them to talk about, right? I mean, we can we can notice that there's retreads of old attacks that are coming back through and and causing 
uh, havoc today like they did maybe five years ago. Um, but I think the, the, two, the two things that are really top of mind right now, uh, IoT attacks. We understand IoT environments were never built you know, to, to really withstand cyber attacks because there was just, you know, we, we had blinders on when we built them, right? We, but one of the other big ones that, that's really reared its ugly head uh, again most recently is the ability to bypass all those great technical security controls by calling into the help desk and pretending to be a privileged escalated user, right? Somebody who has access to do admin work, things like that, to get not only a password reset, but also multi-factor authentication reset. We saw that happen at places like MGM. Um, mm -hmm. We believe it happened at places like Caesars. It's happening more and more in other places. And we just, you know, companies and organizations are recognizing that they pivoted perhaps a little too far to technical controls and forgot the people in the process that also has to go into cybersecurity and just general uh, you know, general good process to begin with. I mean, I could mention ransomware. I could mention a lot of others. We all know about those, but I think to to your point around the the really the newer stuff is really those two. It's almost like the old is the new again. When I first got started in cybersecurity, I just wanted to break into everything. And then as I started to go along in my career, I kind of saw that if you focus on the fundamentals, everything gets a little bit easier. And, you know, I started to fall in love with things like attack service management, uh, light automation that is driven by documentation. Um, so when you think about like the emerging threats, how are security teams uh, combating them right now, especially if they're using things like uh, phishing or uh, doing a scam and spamming through phone calls? Yeah, one of the one of the things that we're seeing with regard to that is we're seeing, um, you know, renewed emphasis on detection, response, and recover. Renewed emphasis emphasis on being able to identify uh, the attack early on in the cycle. Right? If we if we think about MITRE, we want to shift that detection left, yep. and we're seeing, you know, that renewed interest in deriving all the all those detection values and all those response values out of either the tools that they have or potentially additional tools. So we're seeing, you know, still a very tool-based approach, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, uh, but we're, we're at least seeing the recognition and, and the beginnings of recognition that uh, your tools are going to get bypassed, your controls, your technical controls are going to get bypassed. So we have to be able to have a strong detection response recover capability in order to combat that. Um, you know, I, I think about it a little bit like I think about getting sick. Uh, I take my vitamins. Uh, I don't exercise as much as I should, but for sake of argument, we're going to pretend I do. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I eat well, uh, get my eight hours of sleep every night, but still I can get a cold, the flu, food poisoning. Uh, and recognizing that we have to be ready for the fact that we're going to get sick. And how do we make sure that we diagnose that sickness, make sure that we treat that sickness and make sure that we recover from that sickness as quickly as possible. And that's an attitude uh, that, that we're seeing a little bit of change in, but I really think, and, and I think DeepWatch really thinks uh, that we've got to get that one moving faster. We've got to get that concept pushing harder for folks to make sure that they understand uh, the need to react quickly and respond quickly and effectively. Yep. I can imagine that, you know, going along in this journey, it can seem like a straightforward path. I need to refine my security operations. I need to refine detection and response. But when you go through those steps, it actually turns out to be quite a complicated process. I'm sure that's why uh, organizations and teams partner with DeepWatch to kind of help understand what that process is. When you look at that first step though, what is that first step that teams typically take to get a little bit stronger and better uh, when it comes to security operations and things like detection and response? I think uh, one of the first steps that we really advocate is you have to be able to take a risk-based approach to your program. So again, I'll just, I'll use a quick example here. Um, Christmas is coming up. Uh, let's pretend that I have a, a, a child, uh, a young child, and they're going to get a bicycle for Christmas. Now, I've got some options with regard to how I want to think about protecting them, right? I could buy them full body armor, uh, like maybe a, a motorcycle suit, but that might be overkill. Uh, I could do absolutely nothing and recognize they're going to get some scrapes and, and scratches, but 
maybe I'm going to recognize that it's really important to me that they have a helmet because scrapes and scratches and even to an extent broken bones are okay, but I really want to protect their brain. I really want to protect their head because damage there might not really be recoverable for them. It could really impact the rest of their life. So from a risk-based perspective, next to that bicycle under the tree, there's going to be a bike helmet. And that's my perspective on, on how I might do that. So we really want to help customers and companies understand the risk, right? Not the threats. I didn't talk anything about, is my child going to hit its head uh, on the sidewalk, on driveway, run into a tree? I'm not really worried about the threats, but it's the risk of the damage to the head that we want to help companies start thinking about. And one of the toughest parts of that is you cannot determine risk unless you know what it is you want to protect in the first place. So we, we spring ugly words on our, our customers like CMDB. <laughs> oh no, right? The, the boogeyman of every, every uh, IT program, let alone information security program. But we really have to have an understanding of the company's assets, uh, what makes that company tick and what makes that company work uh, in order to be able to take that risk-based approach and help them with that program. Because if we, if we don't have that to start from, we don't know what to concentrate on and, and we can't we can't give the same level of protection everywhere right it's so i'm going to choose the helmet approach and i need to help we need to help uh companies and customers understand and think about that just as a first starting point love that um and i really like the analogies that you were just giving like almost protecting the brain because i mean that's what it's all about is protecting like our IP, protecting our data, protecting our employees, and also our enabling our security operations. The term cyber resilience is used quite a bit. And I think that it's uh, easy to kind of just define really quick, but everybody might have their own definition. How would you define uh, cyber resilience? The good news is uh, our friends at NIST have a definition in 80160, and that is, <clears throat> The ability to anticipate, withstand, recover from, and adapt to adverse conditions, stresses, attacks, or compromises on systems that use or are enabled by cyber resources. Now, that's a great institutional definition. Lots of words. Not entirely sure what that means. Fairly broad. Yep. But that's what NIST is saying to us. And by the way, NIST has been talking about this since about 2016. They started calling it cyber resilience just last year when they updated some of the documents. Mm. From a deep watch perspective, we think about it as, as three key activities, anticipating risk, understanding your environment and knowing what the risks are to your environment. That's step one of three or, or concept one of three. Withstand and recover. To use another analogy, when the tornado comes, right, because I live here in the Midwest and, um, you know, you can see from the, the Chicago sign behind me and, and things along those lines, we're in uh, tornado areas, I believe, Ron, you are too, uh, a little south of me. Yep. And we're very, very used to, what do you do for a tornado? Well, I don't leave my car out. Uh, I leave my car in the garage whenever possible, things along those lines. Because even if the main tornado doesn't get me, the hail might or other things, uh, things along those lines. So with stand and recover, we like to think about it as precision response. Let's get the right response quickly and let's make sure that we don't impact any other business through that response as best as possible. And then the third concept we like to talk about and think about here at DeepWatch is adapt. We want to adapt to the new situations. So to the point you were making earlier about some of those emerging threats, this is the time when we're encouraging customers to go back and think about policy and process and procedure because we understand that a new mode of attack or you know, everything old is new again, as you mentioned as well, a recurring mode of attack is let's bank on you having a weak process for validating who I am when I call up and say, I need my password reset and I need my MFA token reissued. We're counting on that. And so we need to go back and we need to uh, make sure that those are in place. So we're, we want to adapt and learn from not only our own incidents, right? The, the things that happen in our environments, but let's go learn from what MGM did. Let's go learn from Clorox. Let's learn from T-Mobile. Uh, let's learn from you know some of those high profile cases and let's learn from our peers in region who are willing to have roundtable dinners with or 
you know, just uh, being part of an ISSA group or whatever else. Let's learn from what's happened to them. And those are places where uh, we at DeepWatch think we can help with all three of those through security operations capabilities, because frankly, I think security operations is the linchpin to cyber resilience. Oh, yeah, for sure. Everything runs through uh, operations. I, I think, you know, a lot of a lot of times we look at things like threat intelligence. I mentioned attack service management. You still need to operate those practices and disciplines and operations is always directly in the middle. I wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about DeepWatch because, you know, we were on the topic of DeepWatch redefining uh, cyber resilience. What is uh, kind of that that strategy that you like to see uh, adopted by your, your organizations, your customers? And uh, tell us a little bit about the strategy, um, if, if, there, if there is one. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the strategy really is to recognize that, that most of the companies we run into out there, be they small or be they large, uh, have done a, a great job of spending a lot of money to deploy a lot of tools. And security operations often seems to be one of the toughest places for them to really make things work and operate because, number one, it's, it's complicated. You know, let's just right. pretend you've got 60 security tools. You've got to operate all 60 of those in a useful way. You've also, and, and this is the place where I think more companies fall down and could use help. You've got to make sense of the data those tools are giving you, the visibility they're giving you about your environment to understand what's really happening and then what action you should go take. So with, with our methodology, our, our process, we consider DeepWatch to be the platform, the security operations platform, I should say, for the cyber resilient enterprise. And the idea there is we're going to help the, our customers start off with that risk planning. Uh, you know, if we don't have a CMDB, we're going to, you know, we're going to suss it out through conversation. We're going to suss it out through VM data. We're going to suss it out through what's available to us. Help with that. Help make sure that they've got a strong detect response and recover capability and make sure that we're helping them continuously adapt and improve their programs through solutions like um, uh, we have the uh, DeepWatch Security Index score. That's a, a way for customers to compare themselves across time and see how they've improved their program over time, but also helps them compare themselves in an ob objective numeric way against their competitors to be able to answer the age-old question of the board, well, how do we compare to mm -hmm. where you have customers actually get that answer and actually plan to improve their program based on that output. So it's it's through those security operations capabilities. Think of it as MDR, managed EDR, some of the other things as well that all go into security operations that are things that require quite a few people that most security programs don't have these days. Um, and the things that require a lot of uh, custom expertise that is you know, very domain specific, but also depends a little bit on what's your tool set, what's your industry, some of the other things that make it difficult perhaps uh, for, for a lot of our customers to do that usefully and cost effectively on their own. I have to jump in for a second to share some details about our sponsor for this episode, DeepWatch. Being a cybersecurity practitioner, you know that the threat landscape has evolved. And it's time that we flip the script and build resiliency into our organizations. Our sponsor, DeepWatch, is changing the game when it comes to cyber resilience. Their experts work seamlessly with your security team 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This is all made possible with the DeepWatch managed security platform. You may ask, what sets DeepWatch apart? Imagine a focused team of experts working as an extension of your team, providing continuous monitoring, accelerated detection, and rapid response to threats. With DeepWatch, you can see the rapid detections, high fidelity alerts, reduced false positives, and automated actions to ensure that your team is focused on what matters most, precision when responding to threats. DeepWatch has made it their mission to enhance security posture and improve cyber resilience, granting you an unparalleled peace of mind. The best way that you can support the podcast is by working with our amazing sponsors like DeepWatch. 
If you're ready to build resiliency into your organization, visit deepwatch.com and tell them Hacker Valley sent you. Thank you, Deepwatch, for sponsoring this episode. When I first learned about Deepwatch, I was working at a SOAR company, Demisto, which is now called Palo Alto Networks, XSOAR. And uh, I, got a, I got to work with a lot of Deepwatch consultants. When I first got into the game, I wanted to be so technical. I wanted to kind of like take care of all security operations on my own. And then I learned about MDR and I thought, wow, this service and capability is amazing. I've used it uh, for organizations that I've worked uh, with in the past. And I thought it was a huge relief. And it's almost like you get a mentor along the way. Um, and, you know, with mentorship comes, I would say, a little bit of growth, maybe uh, having a little bit of a learning curve. So when you think about uh, working with those organizations that are ready to step their game up, what is that uh, learning curve or how do they have to pay the piper and go through that growth stage? What's some of that uh, discomfort that teams go through uh, just by uh, taking a step forward? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things is um, it, it can be very, very eye-opening for cybersecurity to recognize just how much it has to know about the business its company does. Because right. if you don't understand the business, you don't understand the business objectives. Therefore, you don't understand which assets are most important, whether those assets are people, software, uh, a bunch, you know, databases of PII and PHI, whatever the case may be. If you don't understand those because you don't really understand what your business is doing, and even tougher, what your business wants to do next year or the year after, if you're not there, you're always playing catch up. So one of the toughest things really is to be truly cyber resilient and to get the most value out of solutions like an MDR solution, you really have to have that knowledge about your own company. You have to stop being, and, and look, I'm, I'm indicting myself here a little bit too, right? I grew up as that firewall admin, Ron, just like you're saying, I wanted to be the techie guy that was solving all security problems with tech. We have to grow out of that, right? Cybersecurity is a 35 year old industry we still have some immaturity we have to overcome. And that will come in time. Uh, but this is, that's one of the big things that, that I see in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, difficulties for, for customers to understand is that we really have to do this in concert with the business or they're going to get disappointing results out of the solution. They're going to get disappointing results out of their peers and partners. Uh, one of the other ones is, you know, we, we start to potentially help them call some of their technology babies ugly. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, there are, you know, we, we've got years and years worth of data. We've got great information. Um, we, we've got a, a team that does so much business data analytics about when we get 10 gigabytes worth of data in from this data source, we get three or four alerts. When we get 10 gigabytes in from this data source, we get three or 400 alerts and they're useful, meaningful alerts. Okay, well, wait a minute. So where should we be focusing? What tools are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck? Sometimes it's the current CISO who approved both of those tools, or maybe it isn't, maybe they inherited it. And, and helping work through some of those conversations, that can be another tough one because we want to help the CISO, we want to help the team be a meaningful part of the business, be respected by the board as good stewards of the money that they're being given, as focused on where the business is going, and not as a group that collect security tools to no apparent value. And so those are those are a couple of the key things that, that really can be pain points and they can determine your success with an MDR solution or your lack of success with an MDR solution because it really needs that alignment. You know, we're, we're talking about things far more complex than just making the firewall work. We're really talking about knowing when to hit the fire alarm and get everybody up out of bed to say, we have a problem here we need people focused on working on. Absolutely. MDR, though, what is a successful uh, MDR engagement? What does that look like? And you also mentioned the potential of having an unsuccessful engagement uh, using MDR. Uh, what does that look like as well? Yeah, um, <laughs> that is a $64,000 question if ever there was one. <laughs> um, you know, Ron, uh, I, I think successful successful engagements with MDR really come from organizations who know what they need out of an MDR solution. For some organizations, maybe they just need bodies. And so they need to find the right partner who's going to bring them people. 
Uh, others really, really need a technology. Uh, really, it can be a black box technology because they've got enough people to deal with elevated false positives and things like that that come from some of those technology only solutions. Um, so, you know, those can be very attractive uh, solutions for folks. But one of the things that we find that, that really hampers uh, a good MDR engagement sometimes is just not understanding and not clearly defining what you expect out of mm -hmm. MDR. Is MDR simply, we'll send you an alert and you deal with it? Is MDR, we're going to take care of those alerts for you? Should the MDR organization that you're working with be very, very focused on customizing the alerts to your particular environment? Or are the out of the box, untuned alerts good enough? Uh, a lot of those things that, that you know, uh, organizations might not recognize are key questions about MDR. So where we find our best MDR experiences, those are with the organization that's going in eyes wide open, is looking for partnership, not just a technology, not just people that they boss around, but are looking for a partner who knows MDR, knows how to make it work, has expertise, and is going to be there, sorry, cliche time, in the trenches, um, <laughs> you know, with, with their team, augmenting their team, being a part of their team bringing great technology, bringing great knowledge, and being the leader in terms of knowing how managed detection and response works, but recognizing that we don't know their company the way they do and needing them to be the leader on what's going on in their company and what's important in their company. And it's when we can get a great partnership going around MDR and, and you know all the ancillary things that we do around that, that's when we can have a very, very successful customer uh, relationship and where we can really help customers out. Great. Love that. When people have their plans defined, I'm sure it's always better. That's how, you know, just the day goes. If you wake up and you have a plan for the day, your day is going to be a little bit better. If you have a plan for how you're going to work with your uh, MDR solution like uh, DeepWatch, your day is going to be a little bit better. I, I would imagine that, you know, a lot of organizations, maybe just team members and to be specific, kind of wish that they could just toss the problem over to you and wipe their hands clean. And I think that's one of the uh, fantasies about using AI. I think that's why things like chat GPT are so interesting because it, it, it makes you start to think, is there a world that I could truly offload this task, this responsibility to someone else and walk away from the problem. Uh, from what you're describing, it sounds like that's not really, uh, that, that's not an optimal strategy. The optimal strategy is to at least have some type of touch point and check in with your MDR uh, provider. Uh, I really do believe that that's necessary. Uh, you know, just, just sort of two thoughts on that. Uh, the first one is when I think about a RACI chart, right? Responsibility, accountability, uh, consulted and informed, right? Those are the four, the four letters in that acronym. There's no way for a CISO to ever outsource responsibility. They can outsource some of the uh, accountability, they can outsource some of the other things, but at the end of the day, it's the CISO of Uber, it's the CISO of SolarWinds, it's the CISO of MGM. That's where the buck stops in a lot of ways. And, and so any CISO, any security team who really believes that they're able to just wipe their hands of something this complicated uh, concerns me, right? And that's somebody that I wanna have a long talk with and make sure I understand why they think they're gonna do that and why they would be comfortable doing that. Right. Um, so so that's, that's absolutely one part of it. Uh, on the AI front, um, I drive a Tesla. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that most of the audience saw yesterday's headline about the big recall. It's a software update, but the big recall of uh, millions of Teslas because autopilot is not living up to expectations. Well, call something autopilot and still have to have your hands on the wheel. Maybe there's a problem there, but that's a whole other conversation. I say that to say this. Uh, AI is, to my way of thinking, just the next step in automation. Right. And we've been dealing with automation ever since somebody figured out the wheel. So we are going to do more with it, but it is going to be evolutionary. We have to, rec you know, we have to recognize that it's going to get progressively better, but it won't be the panacea. It won't be the, in six months from now, I can 
uh, I can reduce uh, two thirds of my head, you know, my, my head count in the security department, or I can cover uh, two thirds more uh, environment with the same people I have. It's not going to be that quick. It's not going to be that effective out of the gate. We've got a learning curve and, uh, and it's important to recognize you know, another analogy I, I like to use is, uh, is the idea that uh, we all have different skill sets. You know, if we, if we all sat down and took the same IQ test, we'd come out with different intelligences, right? Right. That's, you know, objectively, subjectively, how you want to think about it. We've got to probably recognize that artificial intelligence is going to be a similar mixed bag. We're going to have some AI that's very good at this and some AI that's very good at that. And the assumption that we're going to find AI that can do all of it all the time really, really well for us uh, is is another thing that maybe it'll happen. I don't have a crystal ball. So Deep Watch is touching all facets of operations like we were speaking about. Like you are kind of like, in a way, the glue that helps the team push forward and push faster. When you look at something like AI, which use cases do you think are most applicable to uh, security operations. There's there's a, a lot of great places to go with that too. I think the one that's going to be most fruitful, the fastest, is really, um, uh, you know, really finding opportunities to look through the collected data over time that you have. The stuff that uh, a human can't analyze in a meaningful way because it's just too much data, and helping us find the needles in that longer haystack. Use cases like. Um, uh, finding uh, finding odd DNS requests that turn out to be um, indicators of uh, of a, a long term um, uh, malicious uh, action and you know an APT in the environment. There we go. That's the that's the acronym I was looking for. Finding those nuggets and those tidbits. Finding the stuff that is just so much harder to find with people and and frankly people's attention span. Right. We are really really good at finding things that happen together in the same time frame and recognizing a pattern there. But stuff that happens over a wider and wider time frame, that attacker who is slow and methodical, that's a tough one for people, even with today's automation, to do a great job of identifying. We've taken some steps in that space, there's still more to be taken. And then I think the business analytics as well, some of those things that we were talking mm -hmm. about, uh, about understanding the value of the data that's being sent in. Should we be getting all of this data from every endpoint in your environment, or do we have a smarter way of getting that because there's other things that are telling us the same, giving us the same information, but in a more concise way, in a more readily uh, acted upon way? Uh, so I think AI is going to help us stop bringing in so much hay, but make sure that the hay we bring in has all the needles in it. Right. So we're uh, just about wrapping up for uh down to our last few minutes but i did have uh one more question for you and you know there's a lot of cybersecurity practitioners that are going to watch this ultimately there's uh some people on the live stream now there's going to be uh, around maybe 10 to forty thousand that watch this later um if you could impart one piece of advice to them to be one step more resilient what would be your piece of advice to them uh, my piece of advice would be admitting to yourself and frankly, to your board and your other C-level peers, admitting the fact that you are going to have a bad day. Uh, the insurer of Viva, uh, I think I'm saying their name right, in the UK, uh, just published a report that suggested that one in five UK businesses has already been hit by some sort of cybersecurity event. 20% of UK companies have been hit by a cybersecurity event already. So, you know, we've we've been building this sort of we'll prevent every attack not, you know, methodology and and we've had that as our mindset for I'd even call it decades, frankly. And we right. need to snap out of that. The first step to cyber resilience, uh like the first step to lots of things is admitting the real problem. The real problem is you're going to get hit. How are we thinking about and how are you building your program to make sure that when you do it's that two aspirin hit, not the <laughs> chest pains going to the hospital in, a, in an ambulance hit. And that's really uh, one of the most important things. And I think as a corollary to that, recognize that that is something you're going to solve, not just with technology, but with a lot of people, a lot of process activities. I recognize that for many companies, adding people 
is just not financially viable. So you got to start getting creative about how you're going to get smart people involved in the process, whether you're hiring them, whether you're partnering with an MDR company or you know other companies that do other things for that matter. I personally speak to every sponsor that comes on the show. I get to hear about their product, hear about their team, and Deep Watch is different. They're special. Uh, Bill, so uh, if you can, share uh, the best way to get started with Deep Watch if someone was interested. Yeah, the best way to get started with Deep Watch is to reach out to us through that website and, and connect with us. Uh, I believe we're going to be making available our Cyber Resilience White Paper as, uh, as part of the uh, as part of this as well. But we're really, again, we're here to help you with those difficulties of your security operations program. Manage detection, response, uh, helping customers actually operate a number of the key tool sets that they have, things like EDR, et cetera. We're really here again, though, as a, as a partner to work with you. We're going to come in with our own ideas and our own concepts about how we do some of this stuff. And we're going to be the right fit for you if you're in need of some technology help, some people help, and really want a partner who's going to be part of your security operations program long term. Uh, if you're really just looking for bodies, uh, that's fantastic. I would tell you that, uh, that we're not going to be the best success for you, and that's fine because there's more than one way to do this, right? There's more than one way to take care of these security operations needs. But we believe that our way is going to help keep you alerted to the most important things in your environment, we're going to be able to provide that precision response I was talking about, take that endpoint offline, disable that user account, do the things that aren't going to cause big in interruptions in your environment and make the response worse than the event. I'm thinking about MGM here as I say that, maybe compared to Caesars. Uh, and we're looking really at helping our customers with that continuous improvement. So if your security operations program needs those things, if you're not comfortable and confident about where your program needs to go, we'd love to have the conversation. I'd love to sit down with you myself. We've got a great team uh, on our sales team that, that knows this industry, right? We hire some serious experts uh, in our sales space to make sure that you're integrating and, and interacting with some of the best and some of the most knowledgeable in the space, people who have experience uh, with MDR for, for years and years and years, who can help you understand how to get the most out of that and how to make it the most valuable in your environment. Perfect. It's all about continuous improvement. I couldn't agree anymore. Bill, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to jump on the mics with us. A big thank you to our sponsor as well, DeepWatch. Again, be sure to check out DeepWatch and uh, let them know that Hacker Valley sent you. And with that, we will see everyone next time.